Hey everybody, I'm meteorologist Brady Taylor. In this week's Degrees of Science, we're talking space weather with Dr. El Sayed Talet. Dr. Talet has spent his entire career studying space weather and the impacts that these space weather events can cause. Dr. Talet explains what space weather is and what NOAA is doing to better forecast solar storms. Here's the full interview. So Dr. Talat, welcome into this week's uh, Degrees of Science. Uh, first off, thank you for joining us, but I want to ask uh, kind of right off the point, what exactly is space weather? You know, we talk weather in my business, but space weather is a completely different thing that a lot of folks may not know about. Yeah, um, space weather refers to the changing conditions on the sun in a near space environment that can influence the performance and reliability of spaceborne and ground-based uh, technological systems. And, and therefore by extension, uh, human health, life, and economy. Um, studying space weather and monitoring and forecasting it is important to our global economy because solar storms and their geomagnetic effects here on Earth can affect the advanced technology that we currently rely upon, we've come, come so dependent upon in our everyday life. Uh, and energy and radiation from space weather events can create blackouts on Earth when they cause surges in the power grids, a damage sensitive electronics on orbiting spacecraft or increase the, the satellite drag that the spacecrafts fly through or ham, harm astronauts in space. Awesome. So, you know, in, in my job, we're forecasting for weather here on Earth. And the more I looked into it, there was some really interesting correlations between regular weather and space weather. Now, I'm looking in the atmosphere, but you're forecasting in the heliosphere. What, what exactly for folks that don't know, what is the heliosphere in space? The heliosphere is the region of the sun's influence. The sun is a is a very volatile ball of gas, and it continually spews out uh, gas into the heliosphere, into the solar system. It also has um, explosions on the sun, uh, solar solar flares, which uh, are electromagnetic bursts of electromagnetic radiation and particles off the sun, and large larger explosions called coronal mass ejections that are billions of tons of matter um, that travel at millions of miles per hour towards the Earth, and they can, if they are Earth-directed, they can uh, interact with our uh, magnetic field and cause disturbances in near-Earth space, and that can translate to the ground. And so, so that's why we watch for space weather uh, events constantly, and it's very much analogous to what we do for terrestrial weather. So NOAA watches for the sun for developing regions of activities, just like we watch uh, the the Atlantic Basin for signs of uh, possible uh, tropical storm activity that can develop into hurricanes that can uh, uh, affect us here uh, uh, in in the Western Hemisphere. And we we monitor the effects of uh, and signs for these explosions, the flares or the coronal mass ejections, these large magnetic bubbles that explode off the sun with remote sensing uh, solar observing instruments on satellites. We also measure uh, the effects of, the, of Earth's near space environment and incoming space weather satellites that sample in place at strategic vantage points between the Earth and the sun. Uh, so the sort of like the uh, uh, upstream buoys that tell us an advancing storms coming toward the shore. So when we talk more of the kind of the connection, uh, what kind of, you know, we, we study a lot climate and climate change here on Earth. What kind of climate research has there been on the sun and impacts when it comes to space weather and its impacts here? So we, we are looking at the long-term uh, cycles of the sun and the sun goes through an 11 year cycle of activity where it's uh, lower lower solar activity and higher solar activity where during those times we see um, uh, more and more of these solar events that can cause uh, space weather effects here uh, in near Earth space and on the ground here at Earth. And uh, uh, we have a long-term record uh, for several centuries of these solar cycle activities. And right now, we are now in cycle 25 and reaching solar maximum where the activity is ramping up. So you were talking about knowing this for a long time. The one big solar event that kind of is the historic one is the Carrington event. And this was back in the 1800s, correct? What, what exactly is this event and what have y'all learned from that event? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was really one of the, the first events that affected our technological infrastructure, uh, because uh, at that time we had the telegraph system and and wires were shorted and, and caused fires uh, were heavily affected by this storm, 
and it was the time when we were first observing the sun and, and understanding that the what happens on the sun on the surface of the sun, where the sunspots that you that develop and then they become active and, and evolve, they can they can cause explosions that could be earth directed and could affect our near Earth space and the and the magnetic field or magnetosphere that protects Earth. And so that Carrington event was a very large storm, the largest uh, uh, up in that, till that time that was uh, detected. And uh, we've, we've done a lot of modeling of that storm. If it had happened in our current time, in our current infrastructure, uh, um, what could happen to our power grid, what could happen to our uh, satellite, uh, satellite systems and, and infrastructure. And it could have, uh, uh, studies have shown that it could have billions to trillion dollars effect of damage and, and, and cost in recovery time uh, from that storm. So this is something that we're keenly aware of. Uh, we only observed it once uh, Earth directed. We've seen it, um, uh, uh, storms of that magnitude explode and go off to the to the side of the sun and not hit earth um and so we are always watching for signs of a possible large storm like that you talk about the impacts this could have and catastrophic that it could have on a big event like this what exactly in your office and with noaa and nasa goes into forecasting an event like this so um, as, as I said, we start with uh, observing the sun for signs of activity, and that's looking at the, the, the solar surface and, uh, and, and detecting the sunspot regions where these, these events could uh, emerge from and look at the activity in those regions and if those, if those regions are becoming more active or less active. And, and uh, we, we have instrumentation that remote senses the sun looking for um, electromagnetic uh, signs of electromagnetic radiation bursts that would uh, uh, be indicative of solar flares um, uh, but also we have what's called a coronagraph a uh, coronagraph is an instrument that occults the sun or blocks the, the solar disk and and you can see the out, outer atmosphere of the corona and where the the large explosions can happen these coronal mass ejections and these are the big huge magnetic blobs that can cause severe geomagnetic storms here on earth um, uh, when we have a couple of uh, eclipses coming up and a total solar eclipse uh, is is nature's chronograph where where we first as humans observe the the outer atmosphere of the sun and now we do that in space with space-borne chronographs that look at that outer atmosphere to to detect any any large explosions. Those ex those measurements that we make from these instrumentations, they're fed into models that predict the trajectory of these large magnetic bubbles, as well as the the background solar wind, the the atmosphere that's spewing constantly from the sun. And, and and look at the trajectory and see if it's going to be Earth directed and what the impact would be and how soon it could hit Earth. So you were talking about all the different things that you use. use. Well, your, your office and NASA are working on a new project, the Space Weather Follow-On Program, where you are gonna put some new uh, equipment out there. What, what's going into that project and how will that help in uh, detecting these solar storms and forecasting it? Yeah, so so the uh, the space weather follow-on program is part of the of NOAA, the National o uh, Oceanic Atmospheric Administration's uh, next generation space weather uh, satellites, and so we're we're developing the I'll call it SWIFO, space weather <laughs> follow-on SWIFO, uh, and it, it is going to do uh, two things. One is uh, put an up uh, a satellite one million miles. Um, the sunwards of Earth, so that upstream buoy uh, measurement that we need to measure the incoming solar wind uh, uh, in situ or in place uh, ahead of ahead of Earth, as well as it has the chronograph um, uh, on that satellite uh, to make the measurements that we need for these large um, uh, to look at the large explosions off the sun. It's also going to put a, a chronograph on our geostationary satellite, uh, the NOAA. Uh, uh, goes U satellite that's uh, going to launch in 2024, um, and that'll give us operational resiliency for that key measurement, uh, that the chronograph measurements to look at these explosions off the sun. Now, the SWIFO L1 mission, L1 is the point um, uh, between the sun and the Earth, one million miles uh, uh, forward of Earth, 
it it uh, it will launch as a ride share with the NASA IMAP mission in in 2025, and so we're looking forward to that as the as the next generation measurements we need uh, for the the input to the models, both to predict the solar wind and the storms that come off the sun, but also the inputs into the near earth space models that predict the effects on the ground. So I know what you're, you're really trying to, I guess, kind of like us in weather, as much lead time as you can get to warn people. What, what kind, if we had a, a big storm that affected a large area, what kind of lead time do you hope to have? And then what kind of processes are going into effect to try to get everything in line where you could react to something like this? So uh, these storms can happen uh, in, very quickly off the sun. So that's why it's very important for us to monitor the sun for possible uh, activity. And that's what we do with uh, the solar, solar sensing, uh, remote sensing instruments on our geostationary satellites, for instance. But when these explosions happen, um, if it's a flare, uh, that can the, the particles and the electromagnetic radiation can travel very quickly to to the earth and so we need to have a warning system that's very uh, quick and our NOAA's space weather prediction center uh, uh, does these warnings and alerts and they have different scales of, of geomagnetic and solar activities just like we do for terrestrial weather in terms of hurricane scales or tornado scales uh, etc that tell our stakeholders and industry and uh, and our emergency responders what to watch out for. The large explosions that can cause uh, a severe uh, um, severe effects on Earth, they they need to travel from the sun and they can they can travel in as fast as as a day, uh, but can also take up to three or four days. The upstream measurements give us uh, for very large storms anywhere between 50 minutes to to uh, an hour or so of lead time for when the storms come right in front of the Earth and coming and are coming directly at Earth. The Space Weather Prediction Center has worked with the power industry and uh, and and civil aviation in particular. Um, the type of alerts and warnings they need, but also uh, for the power grid to take any mitigative steps uh, to to make sure that there's no blackouts or severe effects on their systems. So one of the things we love to do on this show is talk to folks that are passionate about careers in STEM field. And you can, I can tell just by talking to you, you've, uh, you're definitely a space nerd like I am. Uh, what, what keyed your interest or passion to, to learn about space and eventually space weather like this? Uh, I, I, again, like like you say, I was I was a space nerd from the beginning. Uh, I I it, it, the the limitless potential that we have with uh, um, uh, traveling out into the world and observing uh, into the universe and observing uh, the phenomena out there that that's really a, a, it excites me about um, understanding the unknown. And then uh, I was very excited in coming to know and applying kind of that 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 scientific curiosity to an application where uh, it actually can uh, protect life and property of people. And then and it's really the, the, the uh, um, taking that next step of applying the frontiers of knowledge to, to a societal um, application uh, that was quite exciting for me. And how exciting are you, is it for you, just all the advancements and, you know, with the Artemis program, I know that's NASA, but talking about going to Mars, the the web telescope and the stuff we're seeing out there. And then, you know, like I said, y'all's new project, just everything that's going on in space right now and the kind of, a, I know we always call it the new frontier, but everything we're learning and all the advancements that are going on. It's, it's very exciting. And, you know, we work very closely with NASA when we develop our next generation space weather observations, we do that through a joint program with NASA. And uh, similarly with the uh, um, Artemis program and, and human space flight, uh, the Space Weather Prediction Center works with NASA facility that that protects the astronauts and those systems over there. So so it's it's very exciting for us to see um, the, the science developing and and then see the applications that we can and how we can apply that uh, to protecting um, both our technological infrastructure but also our human uh, explorers as they go out for, to the moon and Mars uh, um, and beyond. Well, I tell you, like I said, I, I've done a lot of research for this interview and just learned a ton about space weather. And I want to thank you for taking the time to visit with us and educating our viewers as well. It's interesting, like I said, space weather and regular weather sound a lot alike, but completely different. But uh, 
you know, but it has impacts on us, and I think this is going to be an interesting going forward kind of thing. Uh, but I do want to thank you for your time. Thank you for spending some time with us and letting us know kind of the future of your program. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity.